It's Sunday, April 7th, six months to the day since the war began. We'll hear from military expert John Spencer on every aspect of this conflict and get the latest from Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricus. Keeping you up to date, I'm Michael Dixon, and this is Stand With Us TV Live. Shalom from Israel. None of us will ever forget where we were when we heard the news of the October the 7th massacres. And six months on, it is still hard to comprehend just what happened on that dark day. The most murderous day for the Jewish people since the Holocaust and the effects of the brutality, the glee with which it was perpetrated and the ramifications of that barbarism have spread far and wide. The result, of course, a war to destroy Hamas and bring back hostages. Some of them are now back home, and coupled with that, rising anti-Semitism and violence globally. The first part of today's briefing will focus in on taking stock of what has happened over the last six months, and at the end of today's show, we'll show you some of the beauty, kindness, and unity emanating from this otherwise terrible time, so stay with us. First of all, a roundup on the last week of Israel at war. The IDF has announced the death of more soldiers over the weekend, taking the ground operation total to 260 at this six month mark since October the 7th. They've also released data showing that more than 13,000 Hamas operatives and members of other terror groups have been killed by the IDF in the Gaza Strip since the beginning of the war. That's in addition to some 1,000 terrorists inside Israel on October the 7th, when terrorists rampaged through southern communities, massacring some 1,200 people, mostly civilians, and abducting 253 people to Gaza. 133 men, women, children, and elderly still remain in captivity. Iran's army chief has vowed to cause maximum damage to Israel as it seeks to avenge the killing of a top general. This as daily rocket fire has continued to hit the north of Israel, fired by Iranian proxies Hezbollah from Lebanon. The IDF has conducted an investigation into the bombing of World Central Kitchen cars in Gaza. It found that the strike was carried out in violation of orders, but that commanders believed Hamas gunmen were part of the convoy and that they had not identified the cars as part of the WCK. Two senior officers will be dismissed and several other top commanders in the Israel Defense Forces were formally censured following the event. Israel has also approved further humanitarian measures for Gaza. In a daring raid, IDF commandos retrieved the body of hostage Elad Katsir, murdered in Islamic Jihad captivity in Gaza, to be given a proper burial in Israel. A farmer, social activist and soccer fan, Elad was 47 years old, kidnapped six months ago from kibbutz near Oz with his elderly mother by Palestinian terrorists who also murdered his elderly father. His mother was released but hospitalized in severe condition due to the neglect she experienced in captivity. She has since developed heart problems. A tough week and indeed a tough six months. Well, joining me now as ever for the last six months, our friend, former IDF international spokesperson and now senior fellow for the Foundation of Defense of Democracies, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricus. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you very much for being with us. Shalom, Michael. Thank you for having me. And as always, it's great to be back. Thank you. Now let's turn first to the event that made the most news this week, the tragic killing of aid workers part of the World Central Kitchen convoy. I've seen much speculation and many accusations about this incident. And as we mentioned, the IDF has now concluded its investigation. What do we know? Yeah, what we know, first of all, is that it's a sad event that shouldn't have happened. But the IDF has taken this event very seriously. And, you know, it's been six months of fighting. I don't know how many combat events that needed to be investigated, some really bad events on the battlefield that have happened. But this is the first time that the IDF investigates and also takes disciplinary action with senior officers. Two colonels were actually removed from their positions for violating protocol and acting not in accordance with regulations. 
and there were uh, reprimands to two generals, one two-star and one one-star general. That is how serious the IDF is taking this incident. These are disciplinary measures that the IDF has not taken in six months of fighting. Of course, we're just in the middle of investigating what happened on October the 7th, but that gives you an indication how seriously the IDF takes it and what an important or what the magnitude of the event here. It was a mistake. Israeli officers and fire uh, officers, they mistook the convoy for uh, terrorists, attacked them, not according to protocol, and that is what led to this uh, sad situation. My condolences, just like the chief of staff and the prime minister and uh, many others, our condolences go out to these uh, to the families of the bereaved, and I hope that they are the last aid workers affected by the war, and of course the last uh, non-combatant casualty that we will see in Gaza. But what really is at stake here, and why this is such a sensitive moment, is because Hamas really has ab has been able to put the humanitarian issue front and center of everything happening in Gaza. And while they, Hamas, are stealing humanitarian aid or blocking it from getting to those who need it, and what's actually happening now in Gaza regarding aid is quite tremendous. Israel, together with international stakeholders, is flooding the Gaza Strip with humanitarian aid, specifically food, medicine, and water, but not only that. There's about 300 truckloads of aid coming into Gaza every day, and I think that we will see the number rise as the days go by. And I'm sure that many people aren't aware of it because this isn't mentioned in international media. There are four terrestrial crossings where aid is being delivered from Israel and Egypt to Gaza. Rafah from Egypt, Kerem Shalom from Israel, the Gaza crossing, the new one that Israel uh, built a few weeks ago in the northern part, and then newly opened Erez. So there's four crossings where Israel and Egypt provide uh, humanitarian aid. And in addition to that, there's aid being delivered via the sea towards a temporary pier that is being built uh, in Gaza City. And there's also aid being dropped from the sky parachuted by the US, the Egyptians, Jordanians, and a few other countries that have been delivering aid on the ground. The challenge is, and as it has been over many months, isn't getting aid to the Gaza Strip. The challenge is, once it's inside the Gaza Strip, how is it distributed to the people who need it, the intended end recipients of it? And here the problem is that Hamas stockpiles and steals a lot of the humanitarian aid. I don't have specific numbers, but a lot of the aid is simply taken to Hamas fighters and to Hamas cronies and their families. And then we also have a challenge with the distribution mechanism of UNRWA. They, instead of distributing the aid directly, we see a lot of aid getting stuck in UNRWA facilities. And, I hope, and, and really why this incident with the World uh, Kitchen is such a uh, sensitive time is because WCK is one of the organizations that can possibly help uh, phase out UNRWA and do the holy and very admirable work of providing food to those who need it. UNRWA is failing in that, in that and what Israel is trying to do is to work together with this organization and others in order to provide uh, alleviating services to the civilian population. That's why this event matters. That's why it's so sad that uh, these um, aid workers were killed. Hopefully, Israel will take extra precautions in the future and to make sure that aid workers are safe so that they can continue with their very important duties. And we've seen reports bracing Israelis to expect a direct attack from Iran. Now, what would that mean for Israel, America, and their allies? I think that would be a tremendous mistake by the Iranians. Let's uh, be clear, Israel has been at war and under attack by Iranian proxies directly for six months as we speak. So Iranian proxies firing at Israel is nothing new, not from Gaza, not from Lebanon, not from Syria, and not from Yemen. All of these Iranian proxies have been firing at Israel, directly targeting Israeli civilians for the last six months. So nothing new here. What may change is 
if the Iranians decide to attack Israel directly from Iran, which would be a tremendous escalation, or perhaps Iran would try to attack Jewish or, or Israeli targets abroad. The Iranians might also try to attack U.S. troops positioned in the Middle East, and the U.S. has warned against this happening. I don't know how um, impressed the Iranians are with U.S. warnings, but I think that if the Iranians attack Israel directly, that would be a tremendous mistake on their behalf because then we would Israel would be even more justified. We are justified already to retaliate against Iran, in my mind, because we are being attacked by Iranian proxies who are funded by Iran and provided with Iranian weapons, specifically in order to attack Israel. But if Iran escalates the situation further and attacks us from sovereign Iran, that, of course, would be a welcome invitation for Israel to change our strategy and to change the balance in the Middle East. Uh, mind everyone that Iran has the ability to continue to fund terror and instability and violence and suffering all across the Middle East because it still has the ability to export oil and petrochemical products. If Iran won't have the ability to do that, then they would be forced to think, where do we spend our hard-earned dollar, so to say? Do we continue to uh, spend it on proliferation, spreading violence, instability and suffering in the Middle East? Or do we have to focus it on internal issues inside Iran and to continue to uphold the uh, dicta dictatorial regime that they have in place? That dilemma has not yet been placed in front of Iranian leaders. And I think it is high time that Iran suffers the real and up close consequences of their aggression in the Middle East. Iran is the source of instability and violence in the Middle East, and it should be treated as such by Israel, and I think by the US as well. Now, in a moment, I'll speak to John Spencer about his take, but you and I have been discussing this war regularly on Stand With Us TV. So what's your analysis of the IDF's performance since that fateful day six months ago? So it started with the ho most horrible failure and defeat that we have ever faced on the battlefield on October the 7th. Uh, and from there on, the IDF, together with the other security organizations, specifically the ISA, but also Israeli police, have been working diligently with high morale, high professionalism. And I think what we have now, over after six months of fighting, is a strain of tactical achievements of dismantling most, not all, but most of Hamas's military infrastructure in Gaza, uh, killing the majority of their combatants, killing a lot of senior combatants, not enough, but a lot of senior Hamas military leaders have been taken off the battlefield. These are good achievements. Also the ability to suppress enemy fire, and if you look at the amount of rockets being fired at Israel from October 7 until today, we are at a bare minimum of maybe a rocket or two a day uh, per day fired with no significant effect. And that is thanks to the IDF's ability to be there and to suppress fire. There are tactical achievements and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to go into Rafah to take out the remaining Hamas units there and to cut the tunnels that Hamas is in Rafah is an absolute must in order to achieve basic control over the Gaza Strip and to make sure that Hamas won't be able to rebuild the moment we move out of Gaza. That's clear. But what I am challenged, what I am concerned with, despite the fact that the Israeli security forces, Shabak, police, and of course IDF, are very effective in combating terrorism. We've taken out 330 Hezbollah terrorists up in uh, Lebanon. We have been able to stop most terror attacks emanating from Judea and Samaria, to intercept ballistic missiles fired by the Houthis towards Israel uh, very successfully, and to intercept rockets being fired by Iranian proxies towards Israel from Syria. So many tactical achievements. What I am not happy with is the strategy and where, where, where this war is going. I am not happy with the pace of operations in Gaza. We need to be moving faster, 
harder and to keep our enemies on their heels constantly out of breath and guessing where the next IDF assault will come from. And we need to regain initiative. Like in the first stages of the ground maneuver in Gaza, that's what the IDF was doing. That is what we need to be go back to doing with significant troops and significant capabilities. And we have to have a clearly formulated end state by the cabinet defined so that the IDF and the other security organizations can know what they need to deliver in order to win this war and in order to achieve what we need to do. Uh, so there's still a lot of work left to be done. I am positive and hopeful in terms of the fighting capabilities, in terms of the fighting spirit of the Israeli security forces, both regular and reserves. I am very impressed with them. And what we need now is clear objectives and then resolute capabilities to get there and to continue in order to get the job done so that Israeli civilians can go back safely to their homes surrounding the Gaza Strip and safely to their homes in northern Israel along the Lebanese border without being afraid of terrorists coming across and attacking them in their homes. That's what it's about. Absolutely. And, and finally, we thank you for your service and for joining us consistently to update our Stand With Us audience. Uh, what's your message to our audience as we commemorate this six month mark? My last message, Michael, is that we will have to brace for more difficult months and more fighting. I wish that wasn't the situation, but it is. And the reality, as I see it in Israel, is that we have many more months of fighting in Gaza, on the Lebanese border, intercepting attacks from Syria and from Yemen, and countering terrorism in uh, Judea and Samaria. Uh, so this is not over, and uh, we have to keep strong, focused, united, and with a clear aim on what we need to achieve in order to live here in stability, security, and dignity in our ancestral homeland. And that is what my message and ask of everybody watching this from all over the world. And I know that lots of people from all over the world tune in to Stand With Us broadcast. Wherever you are, stay strong. Steady the course, stay strong, fight anti-Semitism wherever you see it. Be proud of what we are doing here. Be proud of yourself and do not be phased by attacks against Israel or by anti-Semitic attacks wherever it is that you live. And I know that many are suffering anti-Semitic attacks and bullying and uh, intimidation. That's tough, but we have no choice but to fight through it, whether it is in the media, whether it's on the battlefield, in politics, in diplomacy, in economy, wherever it is. We have to know that we are justified and we are totally within our rights to live here in safety and security and in dignity. And anybody who challenges that is not a friend and should be treated as such. And we have to be strong and resolute in our very basic need and desire and our right to live here in peace and stability. A vital message. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Comritas. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Shalom. Let's take stock of what happened on October the 7th now and the six months following. Joining us is a military expert, an award-winning scholar, professor, author, combat veteran, and national security and military analyst. He served as an advisor to top four-star generals and other senior leaders in the United States and is considered one of the world's leading experts on urban warfare and military strategy. It's a pleasure to have him with us today. John Spencer, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thanks for having me, Michael. Thank you. And of course, it's six months since October the 7th, and you came to Israel and studied that day extensively. There's so much to potentially cover, but how would you describe and characterize what happened on that fateful day? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Is it? It's almost undescribable, and people have tried to use descriptions, and in some ways purposely to belittle or to minimize what happened. And after having walked the grounds, uh, interviewed lots of survivors, police, uh, IDF, it was from every aspect, a military invasion of Israel with the purpose of destroying as much of the nation and as many Jewish civilians as possible. Uh, I describe it as an invasion. 
yes, the invaders used terrorist tactics and tried to maximize the the approach, the victimization of civilians. They purposely targeted 20 different sites, most of them civilians. They breached the wall. They committed massive atrocities of rape, mutilations, burnings, just awful things. And then purposely had a guidebook to do it and record it, which is a, a uniqueness as well. Even the, you know, to be honest, the Nazis, um, the Russians today try to hide their crimes. And in this case, in this invasion, which had full intentions to go as far north as they could and to create as much violence and disrupt the entire Middle East as possible, but they wanted the world to see every act and they wore GoPros and had instructions to wear GoPros and how to fix their GoPros. I think people have already forgotten what happened on that day. And that's a travesty in of itself. Uh, it, it doesn't, you know, it's some people try to play with the numbers that, that doesn't really capture. If I say 1200 civilians and others were killed on that day by 4,000 um, terrorists that crossed the border that also launched 4,000 rockets in a few hours um, it's it's intention. It is the methodology. It is the targeting of civilian villages and how they moved to the kibbutzes and secluded them and had a plan to cut off any help so they could go systematically and and massacre as much as, you know, they had guidebooks on how to burn families in their homes, how to roll the tires into their houses so they would die of smoke and also burn. Um, it, it's it's so awful and I'm, I'm not even done studying it, but it's so hard for, to explain to people what happened on that day based on the scale, the methodology, and really the intent of the invasion. And of course, media and commentators love a comparison. And so we've seen several comparisons out there, but is there an equivalent war or conflict to compare this to? Have you ever seen anything like this? So in comparison to the October 7th attack, not in modern times, of course, uh, and the systematic purposely targeting of civilians attempting to burn, you know, you really have to, I mean, it's not only the worst thing to happen to the Jewish people to, since the Holocaust, but you really have to go back to those intentional attacks to wipe out entire villages and, and populations. Now, in the response, which I hope we can talk to as well, there are very few challenges or, or historical examples to the challenge of responding to October 7th, whether that's in the political environment, in the really, uh, unfortunately, because Israel's is held to not just a, a double standard, but some type of ridiculous standard in any time they've ever defended themselves. And the fact that they've never started a war, because that's what Hamas did in historical comparison. Hamas conducted a war of aggression, an illegal war on October 7th against the Jewish people. Uh, and in response, Israel declared a war of self-defense in accordance with the UN Charter. But the challenges in which Israel faced are also historic, as in no other military has faced and we can talk about the specifics, the challenge of the, the military situation to even secure their borders, whether that's to return the hostages, to eliminate Hamas and secure the borders after being attacked. I can't find a historical parallel. One, not because it's Israel and, and it's held to this crazy standard. And it has been, if you look back at the War of Independence, the Six Day War, Yom Kippur War, um, even in self-defense when attacked by overwhelming, when attacked by five armies, it's held to this standard and told to um, not defend itself many times in history. But in the challenge of how do you defend yourself in a world where a lie becomes a truth before the truth is known, in a world where the entire world is watching and criticizing 
but they're also watching because of the uniqueness of ubiquitous technologies. They used to call them TikTok wars. I don't know what to call it now. Um, you're fighting, I think it's fighting in a fishbowl where the world is watching, but you can't see through the water. Um, and they're seeing through a soda straw, a glimpse of a moment. And then that moment is taken by you know, entire world of anti-Semitic powers to manipulate the world and thinking that something wrong is being done and defending yourself. But by every measure, and we can talk about, you know, what parallels there are in history to what the IDF in defending Israel and trying to bring the hostages home have faced. And there is very few comparison. And I've only found one in military history um, that I can say in modern military history, which is a uniqueness that even comes close, but still fails in comparison to the challenge the idea faced in the perception of the use of force in the military challenges of facing a combatant force, Hamas, which is yes, they're terrorists, but they're also a terrorist army for over 15 years that have been given sanctuary and have been the ruling authority in Gaza developed an immense military capability of over 30,000 fighters and 15,000 plus missiles um, and built a defensive architecture underneath its civilian population of over 400 miles of tunnels ranging from 15 feet to 300 feet underground where no military munition could reach the use of human shields every aspect the launching of rockets in the midst of the battle it's historic and there's only one comparison michael that i've ever found in military history and that's the 1945 battle of manila if you'd like me to talk about that yeah absolutely so what so what are the comparisons there so the only comparison that I've found to the challenge or the context, really, it's the context, right? So, yes, you can find all kinds of um, historical examples where nobody's following the, the law of war, right? Russia doesn't follow the laws of war. Syria doesn't follow the law of war. It, it, you name it. Uh, they don't follow the laws of war. So it's really hard to find a comparison, right? I can't compare this to Russia and Chechnya. I can't compare this to the Syrian civil war where they use chemical weapons and indiscriminately bomb civilians. And that's a fact. So the only comparison I can find where you have a moral law abiding military, a just military who has a similar context in the combatant they're facing, who also doesn't follow the laws of war is the 1945 battle of Manila where the U S military who follows the law of war and, and has a moral code, ethical code, a professional code, to follow not only the laws of war, but their own moral ethical framework um, that includes a justice system if you don't follow it. The U.S. military in 1945 launched a campaign to retrieve 4,000 prisoners of war and civilians, men, women, and children, being held by the Japanese military in the city of Manila. The city of Manila was about 1.1 million uh, population. The Japanese had besieged it. The Japanese Navy were prepared to defend it to the death with 17,000 forces um, that had dispersed across the city to defend it. And they were holding these American civilians and British and a couple other countries. And General MacArthur and, and the U.S. administration said, actually famously, go get our people. But he also didn't want the city destroyed. So he put m multiple rule restrictions on the use of force on the American military. So there were 17,000, which, which still pales in comparison to the number of Hamas fighters. But there are 17,000 embedded enemy defenders who don't follow the laws of war in the city of Manila. We attacked with about 37,000 American military forces with immense restrictions on the use of force to include no air power because General MacArthur did not want Manila destroyed and it did not want a bunch of Philippine civilians killed. No air power, no unobserved artillery fire, but sent the military to go liberate our people. And in the pursuit of the battle, the Japanese massacred civilians in the midst of the battle because, again, like Hamas, they wanted civilians to die and they wanted to maximize civilian death. But in the end... In a, within a few weeks, the American military liberated our prisoners of war who had been tortured, starved, um, mis 
killed, uh, murdered for over for multiple years, liberated a great majority of them. But in the pursuit of liberating our people, liberating the city and taking it back from the Japanese, 100,000 Philippine civilians died in that battle. But the only context, so that's the only context I can find in historical examples where you have a, a law abiding military attacking a, a person who uses, who conducts war crimes, defending the use of tunnels. Although the Japanese had, had the sewer system and they created tunnels and integrated that, that increased the complexity of how to get to them. But this is the only comparison and the results was tragic. Um, but it, it incorporates many of the complexities and the context of what the idea faced, but the world, there wasn't cell phones in Manila. There wasn't in a belief that no matter what the Americans do or say, they're lying. It doesn't matter. You're lying. I don't care. I believe the the, the war criminals who are in using war crimes as a method of warfare, I believe them over you. There, there wasn't that in Manila. Hmm. And of course, you've indicated that civilian casualties in this conflict in Gaza compared with the uh, amount of terrorists that are being taken out are comparatively low. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Sure. Um, for some reason, um, people in this war, unlike any war in the history of war, are, are s develop some type of quantitative effects-based condemnation, as in how many civilians have died compared to the combatants, irrelevant of the context of what the Hamas combatant is doing. The fact that it built, there is no military site. There is no Hamas military identifiable site in Gaza because Hamas puts its entire military industrial architecture under civilians, under civilian homes, under schools, under hospitals, in hospitals. But everybody wanted to use the numbers of civilian to combatant ratio to say, look, this is an unjust war. When in fact, it, what I, the IDF have done is executed a just war justly and kept the civilian casualties by taking immense disadvantages in the military approach, kept the civilian collateral damage, the civilian casualties to a historically low number in general and especially a historically low lumber in urban combat, which is very unique to other forms of combat where there isn't an immense amount of civilian populations present that you need to move out of harm's way or in the war quickly to where the enemy's tactics of trying to get enemy or civilians killed isn't work. So yes, in Israel, in Gaza, the IDF have been able to eliminate the, the Hamas fighters at a historically fast pace while keeping civilian casualties to a low pace. But the problem is that no matter what the number is, the world doesn't care. Mm. The world believes, again, a Hamas terrorist organization's civilian numbers. So if you, this is the pursuit of some moral justification, um, despite all evidence of what the IDF are actually doing on the ground, how they have targeted Hamas, how they have moved forward and cleared urban terrain and taken all legal obligations and every precaution that's ever been in invented in urban combat and then created new ones that nobody has seen in the history of war and then still kept the number to low, so low um, to include in the highest intensity, which was the beginning, now six months later to a historically low number that there's no credit being given to the approach that is being done now. And people are using data from six months ago and saying, look, the, the too many civilians are dying to no, despite the fact that the number that's being used includes every civilian death in Gaza over the last six months, what, no matter who did it, um, it includes every Hamas combatant. So according to the number that the world, which is really the problematic place to include global leaders quote now, we're recording really three months into it without putting caveats. It includes every Hamas combatant that has died in Gaza. According to the world, 
that Hamas combatant is an innocent civilian. And of course, while limiting civilian casualties, you mentioned putting themselves at a disadvantage. We've seen over 600 IDF deaths uh, as a result during this war. And so let's think back to the aims originally set. We know about the hostages, of course, but in terms of degrading and destroying Hamas, how would you assess the IDF's progress? So based on multiple visits now to the IDF, to include Incon Yunus, the IDF have effectively, rapidly destroyed Hamas, which is one of the goals. They've also brought half the, the hostages home through military pressure. But by a military metrics, the IDF have successfully cleared a majority of, and there's only a, a small portion as, as we're talking, left for the IDF to clear. They have destroyed Hamas's military capability, as in by the number of coherent military organizations. So as of today, they've destroyed 19 of 24 of the infantry battalions or the, the, the coherent battalions of Hamas, and it still has you know, rocket forces and things like that. They have reduced the number of rockets that the Hamas militants can fire at Israel's civilian sites, every single one of them a war crime. So over 12,000 war crimes, uh, reduced them to, on some days, zero that can be fired. But just by the metric of clearing the urban terrain that Hamas controlled, by destroying Hamas's military capability to where it has a very small fraction, the IDF have moved at a historic pace because it, by comparison to other modern battles, in the context of the defender, they have taken the enemy, Hamas's terrain away from them, cleared the enemy fighters off the battlefield to where they have only a very small fraction of military forces left and done it at a historically low number of civilian casualties to do that effective campaign against Hamas. You can talk, again, every metric, clearing tunnels, destroying Hamas's strategic tunnels, uh, clearing the, the urban terrain. By every metric, the IDF have been successful at destroying the Hamas military's capability and taking it away from them to the point of achieving an ultimate victory, which is in war is really hard to define. But in this war, it's actually very definable. And so we've spoken about some of the misreporting. What do you view as the key piece of context that is often overlooked or downplayed or skewed regarding the events of October the 7th and the subsequent war in Gaza. Yeah, so unfortunately, I, I have to watch the misinformation happen. And usually misinformation has a kernel of truth. Uh, and in some aspects, everything that's been said about Israel at this point, there isn't even a kernel of truth in it. I, I like the fact that the IDF have attacked hospitals. Uh, the IDF have moved forward and secured every hospital in Gaza, removed the Hamas terrorists that were using it for military purposes, and then returned it to operating capability and, and, and aided the civilian population in returning it to it. So not a single hospital in Gaza has been bombed, attacked, but every one of them have had Hamas militants using them for military purposes. So every one of them have been searched. And oh, by the way, there's also six field hospitals that the IDF have facilitated being stood up to increase the capability of just that one essential service, which is care for civilians in hospitals. But every aspect from October 7th, you know, the misinformation that Hamas didn't target as civilians. It, it was incidental civilian you know, deaths when by every reasonable bit of evidence, Hamas targeted and cut off civilian cities like Sarot and Ofakum and villages like Faraza and, and Barry. And, uh, they targeted them, surrounded them, cut them off from support and massacred the civilians. By every measure, everything that anybody knows, the majority is wrong about this war. And it's really the silent majority versus the loud minority who have prevailed for many reasons to warp 
the world's perception of what has gone on on October 7th and every day since. I mean, the fact that Hezbollah attacked on October 8th and nobody covers the immense attack that Hezbollah has conducted against Israel and opened the second front on October 8th. And the fact that 100,000 civilians. I mean, this really, Michael, gets to the question of if it wasn't Israel, how would this war have gone? If it was America, how, what would we do? If six months into the war, there were 100,000 Americans who couldn't return to their home because of threat of a very clear, present, real, daily threat of attack on those on your homes. I can tell you with strong confidence that this war would have gone a lot differently had this been America who was attacked, um, attacked at that scale, invaded sovereign borders, invaded massacring of civilians, thousands of rockets being launched at our cities. I can tell you with strong confidence that the United States military, through, based on direction of the administration, would respond with overwhelming force to bring our civilians home, to make the stop rockets stop raining down, and to remove that imminent threat from our border with overwhelming force. And of course, it's not America, it's Israel. So Israel fights effectively, morally, but partially hamstrung because of the things that you mentioned, the international response and the curbs that are put on it. So why is the outcome of this war important to the United States and to the West? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, this is what is not making the news. Um, this is what has not made the news since October 7th that what Hamas and its Iranian masters did on October 7th was not just horrible by every metric. It was the attempt to rewrite the strategy of the Middle East and really of global terrorism. Develop a sanctuary in which you make it so hard for even a moral just American, Israeli, anybody to attack that they won't do it. If Hamas survives the war, the world is a much more violent place because Hamas will have implemented a strategy to attack Israel and by and and by purpose American interests and American values. And it will show the world that it is possible to attack not just Israel and pursue a grand strategy to destroy Israel as a nation and all Jewish people. That's their strategy. And, and it's interesting that nobody will listen to what Hamas says and writes down. But if Hamas survives this, they will have achieved an immense victory and become, you know, great perceptions and political power that you can strike at the West, basically at American interests, uh, at democracy and you can survive it and you can implement this plan. And we would see October 7th style attacks happening multiple more times. One that Moss says isn't what they want to do, but the strategy will have been validated that you can attack in a hot October 7th style attack, violate all the laws of war and international law and achieve an immense political gain. And that you can use proxies like Iran so Iran, who also wants to destroy Israel and wants to destroy the United States, will have validated a strategy of using proxies to attack a force and achieve an immense political gain and weaken the world in essential. So I think it's of immense U.S. interest that Israel prevails in this war so that Israel is safe, the only democracy in, in the Middle East, and so that all countries are the safe and that the global international order of what can and can't be done in wars maintains. But this is there are so many echelons of why Hamas in Iran cannot have October 7th be some celebrated victory that can be replicated again by every nature of even deterrence of freedom of good versus evil Hamas cannot 
achieve victory. Period. And of course, so much misinformation we discussed it. Social media is very prevalent with, you know, misinformation when it comes to this conflict. And so boil it down for us, just a final message for our audience and perhaps even the TikTok generation. Uh, with everything we've seen from October the 7th and the ongoing conflict, uh, what's your message to the global audience watching about how they should see things uh, that are unfolding in Gaza? The biggest message to the outside world is everything that has made the news or the perception of what has gone on on October 7th and every day since, and especially in Israel's response to Hamas, is wrong. Israel has conducted a just war of self-defense and executed it justly in accordance with every law of armed conflict and every moral sense of moving forward to destroy an evil in Hamas while protecting civilians, while aiding civilians, while doing everything reasonable, feasible, even imaginable to protect civilians in Gaza while moving forward to remove the evil of Hamas and destroy its military capability so that the, not just Israel is, is better, but so that Gaza is better because the only hurdle to preventing civilian harm, the only hurdle to aiding the Palestinian people in Gaza is Hamas. John Spencer, we very much appreciate your analysis and your voice at this critical time. We thank you for your service to your country, um, to all that you do, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Michael. Don't forget, if you enjoy our live shows and want to be kept up to speed with all that's happening in Israel, be sure to click the subscribe button on YouTube. And you can keep our work going strong by donating at standwithus.com slash donate. Thank you very much. Now, before we go, it's been six months of pain, six months of heartache, and six months of anxiety. But during this time, in addition to the heartbreaking news, we've come together, showing the world, as we will continue to show the world, that the people of Israel live. Take a look.
heartwarming stuff. We're sending love to the Israeli troops and to our brothers and sisters and allies worldwide and our prayers for every hostage to be back home with their family soon. Together, we will prevail. Thanks for watching. Am Yisrael Chai.